Hey everybody, welcome to Dad's Dinner Pop Culture. We're doing a mummy movie every week in October this year. Today is time for not really the sequel to The Mummy, but more like, to use a modern term, the reboot of The Mummy. And it's this movie that's going to begin the Mummy franchise that's going to run for a few years for Universal uh, Studios and we're going to get like four movies out of this. But here's where it starts. In a movie that, if I'm completely honest, is not that great and not really that scary, but apparently was enough to launch three more films. So give it credit for that. So we're talking about The Mummy's Hand from 1940. So eight years, I think it is, uh, after the original Mummy with Boris Karloff. Of course, Karloff is not in this one. We get a new actor. We get a new Mummy. So let's jump into this uh, into this fine film. We're talking about a Universal Picture. Oh yes, before I forget though, beware of spoilers because we're going to be going through the entire movie here. So Universal Picture. The Mummy's Hand. First thing you notice right off, we get a very boisterous intro. Loud, booming music. Very unlike the original Mummy, which was sort of an eerie psychological horror sort of film about this, you know, forbidden unholy love, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mummy's Hand, different kind of picture. And I think a movie that... I think the biggest problem they had, well, I think there's two of them, and we'll go into it more in depth, but um, there's a fair amount of padding in this film, and I think they toned down some some of the horror elements because they were maybe aiming for a younger audience. Now, that's a guess, uh, but there are certainly places in the film that you go, this could have been a lot scarier. There was a better way to do a particular scene. Movie stars Dick Ferran. As Steve Banning, he's going to be our hero today. Peggy Moran as Marta. Wallace Ford is going to play Babe Jensen. Now, Wallace Ford did a lot of movies, a lot of B movies, uh, between 29 and, and 1965. Um, not a great character in this film, to be completely honest. Better in the sequel. And better in other movies that I've seen him in. I don't think he had very good material to work with. Uh, Eduardo uh, Cianelli was the, um, I want to say, the, the what would they call him? Like the foreman on the dig. Uh, George Zuko is going to be our great, uh, our great bad guy. Cecil Calloway is going to play the great Solvani. Screenplay by Griffin J. and Maxwell Shane from an original story by Griffin J. And so this is very much, um, it feels a lot like a B-movie. It actually feels a lot like a, um, oh, I'm sorry, I wonder if Cianelli was the high priest. There we go. And Leon Belasco is Ali. Produced by Ben Pivar, Pivar. Directed by Christy Cabanet. So let's get into this dude. Uh, the first view we have to me is not one that's very heartening because that doesn't really look ancient Egyptian. To me, it almost looks like something Incan Aztec, maybe. Um, it's not the first thing you want to see in a mummy movie. Here's our high priest. He is praying. He needs, he's, he's getting ready to retire, and by that I mean retire the hard way. And in Cairo, we have the arrival of, uh, of um, uh, Andoheb, the high priest, played by George Zuko. Of course, Zuko's always good in these kind of roles. He's a great villain. He plays this kind of role in God only knows how many films, just one after the other. Uh, and, he, and, he's, and he's pretty good in this one, but again, they don't give him necessarily the best material to work with. So we get a, a bunch of scenes of camels going across the deserts, and eventually he ends up uh, in the hills outside 
uh, Los Angeles. It's a hell of a walk. Now this I like, and I and because of the the imagery, like I said, that doesn't look to me uh, uh, too much like an ancient Egyptian motif. I really wonder if this isn't reused from a, some other film, and you know, if I go hit, I don't know, Wikipedia or something, maybe you'll find out if it was. But man, that's a that's a great set. The steps going up to this temple. And in, in the temple, Endoheb talks with the high priest who's giving him his instructions. So you're basically going to be the new high priest. It's time for me to go. So now we're going to get some reused footage from the mummy. We get the, the swirling mists. And then we, but now what we're going to see is any place where you could clearly see Boris Karloff's face, we now get Tom Tyler, who's playing Karas, this ancient high priest. And a year later, he was going to be playing Captain Marvel. Um, so we get those close-ups of him. But anytime it's not, you don't need a close-up of him, you're getting reused footage from the first mummy. And it essentially tells the same story. High priest in love with this princess. She dies. Now, there's a slight difference in this one. Because rather than go for the scroll of Thoth, or Toth, uh, as we got in the mummy, He's going to go for Tana Leaves. Tana Leaves are the key to the mummy walking around and staying undead for thousands of years. So he gets the Tana Leaves. He is caught. He is sentenced. And then again, we're going to get the same footage of him being put to death and wrapped up uh, as the mummy. And I want to say that they go to a little step further and they um, they cut out his tongue. So that's sort of that. Okay, so he says, this is how Karas came to be. His job now is to protect the tomb of the princess and you're to assist him. Shows him where the Tana leaves are kept. Shows him how to brew the Tana leaves. He needs three leaves in a brew at every uh, full moon to stay supple and youthful, we'll call it undead, basically. Nine leaves, and he can and he could walk, he can move around. And if he was to get more than that, he would be an unstoppable monster. And he gives him his medallion, which has some details on where to find this place, which obviously he already knows. And then I'm coming, Elizabeth, uh, and then that's the end for our high priest back to modern Cairo, and we're now going to meet our heroes, Steve Banning and Babe Jensen. They're going through a bazaar. They're more or less out of money. Um, they're going to have trouble getting back to America even, but maybe they have just enough money. Things are not going particularly well for them. They go past a beggar, and Steve gives them something. But as they're going past, the beggar gives them a look, like what's going on here? So Steve finds this, this vase in the bazaar and thinks that it holds a clue to the to the whereabouts of the, the tomb of the princess. And this is, by the way, a princess Ananka, yeah. which is a lot easier to say than the other princesses. Name which I had to really train myself on and I've already kind of forgotten. Anksanaman, that was it. So now we're dealing with, now, now that I've said it, now I'm going to have to think every time I do this. Now we're dealing with uh, Princess um, uh, Ananka, 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 Ananka. Okay, so we're in, <laughs> we're in the bazaar. Now while he's buying the vase, Babe buys this little mechanical toy that does a little hoochie dance. And oh, we're going to have to see that thing an awful lot. And he's like, how much did you pay for that? I paid a lot for it. Damn. So they take it to this professor, um, and he, uh, Dr. Petrie, played by Charles Trowbridge, and he said, oh, this is this is genuine. This is great. We could launch an expedition to find Princess Ananka's tomb. And he says, let's go show it to the director, you know, of this museum. Ooh, the director just happens to be Andoheb, the high priest. And he looks at it, and he says, no, this is crap. It's fake. I'm sorry you got ripped off. It's not genuine. Um and therefore, we're not going to be financing 
in the expedition. Well, obviously this is because he knows that it in fact does lead to Princess Ananka, and he is sworn with protecting her tomb, which if you think about it, not actually a bad thing. And then he accidentally, while they're talking, because Steve's like, well, I'm going to go find it anyway. Give me back my vase. And he accidentally uh, drops it, breaks it. Steve collects it up. And he uh, he goes off. And, and Dr. Petrie's going to help him because he still believes that it's genuine as well. And after they leave, Ali, the beggar, comes in and is getting his instructions to keep an eye on those guys. So the problem, though, is they're not going to have financing. They got to find financing if they're going to go have this little adventure. And so they have. Um, oh, and so that is the medallion then that was that was being held by uh, Andaheb. That's kind of the map to where you find uh, Ananka's tomb. So they go to a bar, and Babe is sort of a he's like a Brooklyn guy you know, kind of a wise guy, and he's doing this little trick that's supposed to help make him a little bit of money, this little card trick, and it doesn't really work. And Steve gets a reply from a museum in the United States, and they're like, yeah, we'll hold a, a position open for you, but no, we're not interested in financing this. That doesn't sound, you know, doesn't sound real to us. The Museum of Manhattan. I looked it up. There's no, no such place. Uh, so they're in a bad spot. They are kind of out of money. They can't get money for their expedition. Whatever shall they do and enter the great Silvani. Now, Babe Jensen says, oh, well, this guy, this guy looks like a pigeon. I can get some money out of this dude. Not knowing that he is, in fact, a magician who's been playing uh, Cairo, assisted by Marta, and that is his daughter. And so he tries to do the card trick, and it doesn't really work out, but fellow Brooklyn guy, they get along pretty well, and they decide to uh, have some drinks. Ali kind of wanders into the bar at this point, and while they're talking about this expedition they want to get funded, Silvani and his daughter, they're getting ready to head back to the United States, but he has some money, and he's kind of interested in funding this expedition. And Ali is watching and listening. And he gets information back to Andohab about what's going on. Now we meet Marta. Um, Peggy Miranda does a great job in this movie. She did not do a ton of flicks. Uh, worked from 38 to 43. Her last film was King of the Cowboys with Roy Rogers. Great energy, great charisma, as does Cecil Kellaway playing Sylvani. And like I said, Wallace Ford can be great in flicks, but... In this one, it's a character that's a little bit annoying and cloying, to be honest. Steve Banning, Dick Ferran, not a ton of energy. Not a ton of energy in this one. And I think that does hurt the film, since he is kind of the lead action hero, for lack of a better term. So she's in there packing, and Andaheb shows up. And, you know, oh, I'm an admirer. I've seen your magic act. It's really, really good. Hey, by the way really got to watch out in Cairo because there's con men who will cheat you out of money saying they need to fund an expedition. So you better watch out for those folks because they're not to be trusted. And there's a really, really, really pivotal scene here. And you don't realize it's pivotal till the end of the movie because I think they almost forgot to, well, he makes an attempt at kissing her hand. And she pulls away. And he's a little bit offended by that. Apparently, at this moment, in this brief meeting, Andaheb has fallen head over heels in love with Marta. But, you know, she probably thinks he's a geek. He's a freak. She's probably not the first. Anyways, um, she... This is really important to the last part of the movie. And I'll be honest, I had to like, when I got to that last part of the movie, I was going, wait, where did this come from? And I'm going back, back, and I finally like, oh, yeah. That moment where he tries to kiss her hand. Not very well telegraphed. And so uh, so she's been warned about, you know, these potential guys. And don't worry, we're not going to have any problem with that. 
So Ali gets some boys all riled up, starts something to get a fight going. There's Silvani signing the, the note that he's going to loan them the money. And uh, at that point, this guy like runs into them purposely, gets a fight started. We get a little bit of action. Uh, we got the bartender making a crazy face screaming. And they jump out the window and escape. Okay, now, here's the thing. At about this point in the film, we're almost, I think, almost halfway through the film. It's only a little over an hour long. And we ain't seen a mummy yet. Nor have we seen, well, a little bit in that flashback. We haven't also seen anything particularly horrific. What we've had is a little action scene, some technically comedy, and a lot of setup. There seems to have been a lot of padding in this film. Now, The Mummy's not that much longer. It's about the same length. Did not really feel padded at all. It was a pretty tight little script with some great scenes. This one, not so much. So, Silvani gets back. He's drunk. She finds out what's going on, and she is not happy. And he's like, no, 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 it's cool. These are good guys. Trust me, we're going to go on an expedition. It's going to be a lot of fun. You'll love it. And she uh, sees the note that he signed, but he doesn't like, he doesn't know where they're staying and stuff. And she's like, oh, you know, that's it. They're disappearing with the money. But then he has this letter, Cairo Hotel. She realizes where they're at. So she's going to deal with it. So she pulls out a gun. And there's an interesting little voiceover that you can tell they added later where she refers to it specifically as her trick pistol. Because I guess they realized, oh, we didn't make that obvious. Or maybe they thought initially it was going to just be a real gun. I don't know. And that's, again, where I think there might have been a desire to make this more for children. And they tried to soften a few parts up. So he drunkenly falls into this um, into this trunk. It's like an escape trunk, you know. It's a trick thing, and um, he escapes into a different trunk and is stuck in there. And that affords her an opportunity to uh, go deal with Steve Banning. Again, we're we're wasting a lot of mummy movie without a mummy. She shows up at the hotel, confronts Babe, and um, pulls the gun on him. And, you know, he's kind of like, oh, do you know what you're doing with that? And then she shows him by shooting a heart into that uh, into that door. Steve's on the other side of that door. Well, not directly on the other side. He hears the gunshots. He comes out and sees her holding the gun on Babe and manages to defuse the situation. And explains to her, no, 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 this is not a fake. This is not a fake. Well, she wants the money back. Well, we've already we've already paid for the expedition. You're you're basically stuck. We can't get the money back. That's not happening. Again, she's not real thrilled, and she doesn't quite trust these guys. But um, you can see that Steve's already kind of like, you know, she's kind of keen. I kind of dig her. So once again, montage. We're going across the sands on camels. We eventually get to the site where they're digging to try to find this tomb. And it's not going particularly well. But while they're digging, um, they do manage to find, well, they find some bones. And on the bones, they find this locket. And this belonged to an earlier archaeologist who was going for the princess. So they think, oh, that's actually a good sign. It means we're, we're pretty close. So Babe is fooling around with this dynamite a little further over. And there's suddenly a boom and uh, an avalanche of sorts. They come over. They find that Babe is all right. At the time, I was like, eh, too, too bad. No, Babe's actually going to redeem himself in this movie. Believe you me. But what it does is it uncovers the entrance to a tomb. The tomb of Princess Ananka. We found it. Awesome. They pan upwards and we see that Andaheb and the beggar are watching. So they pile into the tomb, nice and dark, and they find a sarcophagus. And when they get into the sarcophagus and open it, 
oh my goodness, what did they find? They found the mummy. But they also realized this is not Princess Ananka. This is a boy mummy. Pretty good makeup there. I do like it, although there's going to be some scenes later where there is one kind of flaw to the makeup, and I do notice that in the sequel as well. We'll, we'll get to that in a moment. So the wolves are howling that night. And our little band is around the... By the way, we have finally now gotten to the mummy. And at this point in the movie, you're going, we have just met the mummy. There is not a heck of a lot of time left in this thing for him to, to run riot and do all sorts of crazy mummy stuff. So they're around the campfire at night. Everybody's feeling a little bit spooky and a little bit worried. They hear the howling. They don't like it. Inside, Steve and Dr. Petri are examining the mummy and finding, you know, just as with the first one, this is kind of a weird mummy. This isn't the normal mummification process. And the professor has found in this big jar over there, tana leaves, which are extinct. So these are very, very ancient. So Steve goes back outside. And at this point, he's talking with his foreman, who's like, uh, everybody's freaked out about finding this mummy. Nobody's coming back. Now, he, he sticks with them, but nobody else is. And, um, you know, he hears the howling as well. And he's like, oh, this is this is not good. Apparently, he's seen horror movies before. At this point in the tomb, who should show up out of nowhere but Andoheb? And Petri's like, what? You know, because to him, he's, he's this, this doctor, this museum director. What are you doing here? And he starts giving him a little lesson in the mummy. Uh, obviously, Petri is a little bit surprised. And he starts explaining to him how the Tana leaves work, and he has this little little tincture, and he gives it to, to the mummy, to Karas. And he says, tells the, the, the doctor, um, feel his arm. And the doctor feels it, and he's, there's a pulse. Now, here's a scene where you have a great opportunity to show something, make it scary. Build up tension. They really don't. It's just while they're talking, the mummy grabs a hold of his throat, uh, checks his pulse, and finds that it's it's no longer uh, no longer pulsing, uh, and that's because he strangled him to death. So there's a horrible you know scream that everybody hears, and uh, at this point, Endoheb's taking control of Karas, and he's you know follow me, and he's going to use him to protect the tomb. And so they go in, and they're going to ultimately find uh, Professor uh, or Dr. Petri on the floor dead. And what could have done it? Because there's obviously a secret entrance in here, and they don't know where it is, and they don't even know that the, there is a secret entrance. So apparently, he just suddenly screamed, fell over dead, and the mummy left. But this doesn't make anybody feel any better. So Ali is now getting instructions from Andahem about what he's going to do next. You're going to take this little tincture of the Tana solution and you're going to hide it in people's tents. And then I'm going to send Karas into those tents looking for it and he's going to kill people as he goes. Okay. Mummy stalking victims. Okay, good. We're going into horror movie territories now. And then we're back to the magician doing a lame trick for Babe and the and the foreman. Is this a setup that's going to pay off? No. Was the escape stuff a setup that's going to pay off? No. Weird. It's it's a lot of padding. So Karis is getting his instructions. Looks great from that angle, and the high priest is saying, "Look." Your arm isn't working right now. One of your legs isn't working. If you want him to, you're going to have to find more of the solution. And uh, you're going to have to obey me. And he says, where you find the little bottle, kill, kill, kill. Faster, mummy, kill, kill, kill. So they're still working out what has gone on here. 
and Marta's doing some. You know, she's looked at uh, at that vase that has the uh, the sort of uh, map on it, and she's going. You know, maybe, maybe this symbol here is this tomb, and you notice it looks like there's a passage to the tomb of Ananka. So maybe there's a way through here. There's a secret door. There's there's something that we can find a way passage through. So Marta, important piece of the puzzle that she's found. And Steve is more in love with her than ever before. Um, so they tell they get the other two in, hey, we're going to have to do some digging. we got to see if we can find this other passageway. The foreman's out there on his own. There's more howling, etc. He's nervous. And he hears Ali in that tent placing the bottle. And so he goes in and he finds the bottle and then he finds Karas. And uh, then he doesn't find anything ever again because Karas strangles him. Oh, we've had our second mummy murder. But again, they don't build the tension up quite like they could have. What you can do with a mummy is more or less what you get with like Michael Myers with Jason. This unstoppable supernatural thing that just keeps coming no matter what you do just keeps coming after you so um we've lost our foreman they're in there still digging they ain't finding nothing but they do find the tana leaves and don't really know what they do so they're they're quite at a loss and they decide look let's pack it in we can get working in the morning but you know this is we're not we're not getting anywhere at this point um when when Sylvani and his daughter go to go into their into their tent, they find the body of the foreman. And she's very upset, as one would be. And he notices, yeah, he's strangled. And I think it's when he notices like the the dust, same as Petri, and they're like, okay, let's let's strap on our guns because there's something going on. So he goes to comfort Marta at the campfire and says, Look, why don't you guys use my tent tonight? You sleep in there. Me and Babe are going to stay up and we're going to we're going to guard. Of course, Ali is now planting the bottle in Steve's tent. Uh, nice little scene between these two. Really, honestly, a good scene. They're kind of connecting and they're talking about Steve, etc. So now we get, well, what do we get? It's really hard to see if we clean it up a little bit. I mean, basically just auto level the, the image. We get cars walking through this forest that they found. But this scene, really hard to see. And again, this should be the slow walking mummy coming inexorably at you. And instead, it's just really dark and you can't see anything. So Steve and her have a little scene and they're, you know, good night. And she gives him this little kiss, which is really nice. And Babe almost chokes himself trying to do a magic trick. Again, is this a setup? No, it's not a setup. So, uh, and, you know, Steve's like, ah, God, dude, what is going on with you? Silvani's getting ready for bed. He finds the little bottle, doesn't know what it is. She's a little nervous as well. And here comes Karis. And we see his shadow. But again, it's a shadow in the dark. So it's not... I think they could have lit these scenes a little better. I think it was, you know, trying to make things look darker than they really were. So in comes Karas, uh, and he finds um, Silvani, and Silvani finds him, and he's a little bit freaked out. And um, gets the strangulation treatment. Now, Marta awakens and screams, which brings Steve and Babe and... The mummy can't really finish the job on Silvani, but he does grab Marta. Now, here was the moment of me going, wait, why did he grab Marta? And I went back, and I don't believe Andoheb ever tells him to do this. But then I thought back, oh, the attempted kiss. Okay, Andahab is in love, or Andoheb is in love with Marta. And the mummy steals them. So I think they kind of forgot a scene here. 
because the mummy again i don't think he brought her back on his own um you know because that that really wouldn't make any particular sense so he runs off with marta and ali is now sneaking around the camp as well and those two got their guns and they know they got to do something about this so we get the mummy carrying marta there's some nice shots there they go back into the tomb. They're, they're like, there's got to be a secret passage. Babe says, look, I'm going to just go around the mountain on foot. You stay in here and see what you can figure out. And um, at that point, they hear Ali in the camp. And um, they go into investigate, Or maybe they were going back, but they see him out there. And so they charge in. He pulls a knife on him, and they shoot him. And he sees the medallion and he's like, okay, that's the beggar. There's something bigger going on here. But now he's got this more complete map and he goes, okay, maybe I can use this to figure out where that secret passage is. And Babe talks to his little hoochie coochie doll and says, baby, I'm going to need your luck now. Yeah, the hoochie coochie doll bits just don't work. None of the comedy in this really works. Uh, and that's a problem in a horror movie. Great shot of the mummy carrying Marta into the tomb of Ananka. And a great looking set there. That's fantastic. I really love that. Again, I do believe that is from a different movie, although I could be wrong on that. Puts her on the altar. And basically now, what you're going to be getting here, at least theoretically, is what Imhotep was doing to Anxanamen in the first Mummy movie. He's going to inject her with something and 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 make her live forever. That kind of that kind of deal. And that looks like an awkward uh, school photo. So he's now giving orders to Karas, you know. Um, Kara seems a little bit upset by the developments here. So Steve's looking around this tomb while he's got her tied down. Um, boy, classic, you know, sort of soft bondage stuff from the 1940s. And so he finds uh, the pieces of this, I don't know what it was, like a clay tablet of some kind or pottery and starts piecing them together. And that's going to show him Again, kind of what he saw on the on the uh, on the medallion. He's now giving her the the villain speech, and he finally figures out. Steve finally figures out it's behind the sarcophagus. As Karis is sent out to finish the job on Stephen Babe, um, so he, he's now finding this tunnel and he's going through it. And actually, I think Karis was. Karis was in the tunnel. I feel like he was following Karis at this point, but didn't know it. And so you see there, Andaheb has this uh, uh, syringe that he's going to inject her with this stuff. And Babe is coming around the mountain and I think makes a noise that Andaheb hears. And this stops him for a moment. Now, I said that Babe, who frankly, and no offense to Wallace Ford, Babe is kind of annoying through most of the movie. Because he's comedy relief, and the comedy is not really funny. I don't think there's anything he could have done to make it funnier. The comedy was just kind of lame. But he is about to redeem himself in a big way. So on to Heb, stops what he's doing, goes over to a drawer, and gets a revolver. And he meets Babe. As Babe's going up those stairs into the tomb, he comes out and he meets him there. And he's got the gun hidden, like, in his sleeve. And they have this little, you know, back and forth. And, um, you know, Ford's like, hey, where, you know, where's Marta, et cetera, et cetera. And he takes a shot at him and misses. But Babe don't miss. And he shoots him and he falls and he rolls down those stairs to the bottom of them. And our high priest is now dead. Or is he? 
So he's, and this is a great scene because Ford is actually a little bit shaken by the fact that he just shot a guy and killed him. I, Ford was a decent actor. He just often, he oftentimes didn't have good material to work with. I know he had some problems with alcohol too, and I think that that probably took a toll over time. So Steve has finally found his way to the climax of the film. And he sees Marta, runs over, starts trying to free her when Karis enters. Dum, dum, dum. Oh, yeah, Karis was behind him in the tunnel. That's what it was. So, of course, pull the gun. Hey, look, we laugh about it, but what are you going to do? A mummy's walking at you. You got a gun. You try the gun. It might just work. Well, it doesn't just work. But he does manage to um, smash the Tana solution because uh, Marta told him what it was. And so that's what Karis was after. And so he tries to hold him off with the gun. Now, what I laughed about in this scene, again, if you lighten it up, you can see, you could clearly see Tom Tyler's hair. They just slicked it back. And I'm like going, you couldn't have given him sort of a thing that looked more like bandages over his head. It, it just kind of looks, looks funny. And um, we'll see that in another film uh, for sure. So uh, Karis and Steve uh, have a little uh, difference of opinion, which results in Karis uh, choking Steve and throwing him to the side just tosses him like a rag doll. So Steve's a, kind of at a loss for how he's going to defeat this thing. And he's making his way to the Tana solution. And remember, if he gets more than just a little bit, he is unstoppable. At that point, Babe comes in. And he shoots and smashes the solution. So once again, Babe kind of more the hero at the end of this than Steve is. He takes out the high priest, takes out the Tana solution. So Karis, desperately seeing it spill that way, gets down on the floor like trying to lap it up, which is, if I'm honest, kind of funny. And Steve grabs that that fire and, uh, and throws it down on the mummy. And they all, you know, have a nice moment watching Karis horribly burn, alive, well, not alive, undead. And there we have the end of Karis the mummy. Or do we? And uh, Marta faints at this point, and Babe's like, oh, just like a woman, can't stand the excitement, and she faints. And, of course, then Babe faints as well, which was actually kind of funny. He did a good job with that bit. So back across the desert, and our happy band finds their way back in Cairo. Time to go back to America now. Um, I think Steve gets the letter from the museum. They're super impressed and they want to hire him. So the end of a universal picture. So what do we have with this fine, fine film of ours? Um, it's not really a horror movie. It is incredibly padded. I'd say they had about 20, 25 minutes of story that they had to sort of stretch over an hour and like eight minutes, something like that. The comedy bits don't work. The little fight scene was fine, but it wasn't great. And you just don't get enough of the money, of the mummy, who is the money, uh, the mummy going after everybody and strangling. That was That's where you really want the movie. And that's why I thought, were they trying to make this something that moms would not freak out about their kids going to see? Was it more matinee fodder uh, than it was like uh, the original Universal horror movies, which were obviously meant for adults? I don't know for sure. That's kind of the impression that I get. So all, overall, um, aside from some nice sets and, you know, Zuko's good and Peggy Moran is good and Cecil Kellaway is pretty good. 
aside from that, you know, you're probably giving this thing a grade of a D. It's it's just not that good. But it does launch the Mummy franchise. And the next movie, I actually think, is an improvement on this one. And is a really interesting sequel for another reason. But we'll talk about that. We'll talk about that one next week. So, folks, that is... The Mummy's Hand, 1940. Not a great flick, but it does set up the next three movies, so it's worth it in that regard. And look, it's kind of a fun, you know, not really spooky, spooky movie that you can kind of, yeah, you pop some popcorn, you know, you get a you get a pop or something, and you sit down with the fam, and you watch a Mummy movie. It's not the best, but it's not... It's not absolutely horrible. There's much worse movies than this, but it is a little bit of a letdown after The Mummy, which I think was really a pretty cool, eerie sort of film. Well, what do you say out there in uh, in TV land, so to speak? Uh, what do you think of this film? Is it one of your favorites? Do you not like it? Um, not going to get into spoilers. Certainly don't want to start talking about the sequels really, really yet. Um, because we're going to be covering them over the next few weeks. But let me know in the comments what you think of The Mummy's Hand. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, maybe please give it a like. Maybe think of subscribing. Maybe think of sharing with a friend. That would be really groovy. Helps my little channel grow. And we do have more horror content on the way this October. Like I said, we're going to be looking at the other Mummy movies and there's a couple other videos you might enjoy coming up as well. But until next time, God bless everybody. Please be kind to one another. Have a little spooky fun. And I'll see you again, hopefully very soon, in Dad's Den of Pop Culture. Bye-bye.